Turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. When you find the book of Romans, if you will, go to the 12th chapter. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture. And as the Lord leads, I want to speak to you this morning on something the Lord really laid on my heart this week. I want to talk to you for a few minutes on this subject. Now that you have freely received, freely give. Now that you have freely received, freely give. Verse number one, chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And I want you to notice the last part, which is your reasonable service. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you for the music. During these moments that we have together, I ask that the Holy Spirit of God will help us today to look into this passage of Scripture, to dissect it, to look at the depths of it, the meaning of it, the power of it, and help us to make the personal application in each and every life represented in this building and beyond these walls. And I'll thank you for it. I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. I read this statement several years ago. I kind of disagreed with the statement at the time, but the years has changed my opinion. Someone years ago made this statement. They said the greatest book ever written in the pages of human history is the book of Romans. I've come to the place in my life after studying this book, studying the Bible for a long time, I've come to the place where I believe that statement may be true. Because the book of Romans has changed the course of history. There's no question about that. Martin Luther, who was a man embedded in Catholicism, was involved in sacraments, works, trying to earn his way to heaven. And I remember in a college course years ago, a man who went into the history of Luther said that he was punishing his body because they believed that bodily punishment would bring penance. It would remove sins in your life. And he had broken some walnut shells and he had tied those walnut shells around his knees and was on his knees going upstairs placing himself in a position of immense pain, believing the pain would eradicate his sins. And while he's climbing those stairs on his knees, Romans chapter number one came to his mind, where the Bible says, out of an Old Testament passage of Scripture, the just shall live by faith. That verse is found three times in the New Testament. Book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. In the book of Romans, the just. In the book of Galatians, shall live. In the book of Hebrews, by faith. 
Luther said, I'm not living by faith. All of a sudden, he came to the realization that I can't live by faith and live by works at the same time. One's got to go. So he got up off of his knees and eventually nailed what was called 95 Theses on a church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And he went out because of that passage of Scripture. And he started what we call today the Reformation. It literally changed the world. I'm not saying that I believe everything that's involved in the Reformation. That's not the debate at this time. I'm just saying that he used the book of Romans to bring about the salvations of tens of millions of people down through these years who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There was another man years ago who was named Augustine. Augustine was wrestling with things in his life. He had no assurance that he was saved, but he was trying to work to gain favor with God. The story says that one day he was sitting out in his garden. He was wrestling with his life. He was wrestling with what he knew and what he understood about the Bible. And he felt compelled to leave his garden and go up in his house and open up his Bible. And he opened up his Bible to the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, the 13th chapter, he read, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riot and in drunkenness, not in cambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. As a result of his exposure to the book of Romans, he trusted Christ as his Savior and became one of the great teachers of Bible truths in bygone days. John Wesley came to America to bring the gospel to people in Georgia. And he labored there for a long time, but he did not have the assurance of his conversion. He got on a ship and he went back to England and he wrestled with it all the way across the ocean. And after he returned to England, he was walking down a street called Aldersgate Street. And he came upon a little meeting taking place in a side house. And he walked inside of the room. And a layperson had a book written by Luther. Open. And he was reading Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. And as he listened to the commentary on the book of Romans, Wesley later recorded that suddenly his heart was strangely warmed. And in those moments, he came to a true confession and conversion. And he accepted Christ as his personal Savior. Now that story can go on and on and on with other people in history who have come in contact with the Bible, but not just the Bible. They have come in contact with the book of Romans. And the book of Romans has inspired conversion in their lives. The text I have read today in our hearing has the possibility of bringing about change in our lives. Because this passage of Scripture as we analyze it, as we read it, as we think about it, is a challenge to all of us who know Christ as our personal Savior. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has spent 11 chapters, 11 chapters talking about that vast chasm that exists between the human race and a perfect God. And he has taken 11 chapters to reveal to the readers, to reveal to us today something about the mercy of God. In chapter after chapter, 
He has talked about what God did to bring about reconciliation between the human race and a perfect, holy God. The book of Romans talks about the utter depravity of the human race. In the first chapter of the book of Romans, it says that every mouth must be stopped. In other words, there's not one human being in the human race that has anything that they can lift up, anything they can brag about, anything that they can talk about that would gain them favoritism with God. Every mouth must be stopped. In other words, anyone who would try to justify any kind of lifestyle outside of the overshadowing mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, they should just shut their mouth. Because nobody has justification to find agreement with God unless they've come to the mercy of God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason in verse number 1, he said, I beseech you therefore. The word therefore is going back and it is picking up on everything that he has said in these first 11 chapters. How man is estranged from God. How man is condemned before a holy God. And how the Lord Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven to come down here to bring about reconciliation between a holy God and an unholy people. That's what all of these 11 chapters are about. Therefore, because of his great mercy in these first 11 chapters, I want you to notice, he said, we have now responsibility. I've heard people down through the years make a statement like this. I wish I could get more of God in my life. After you read the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, that's not the question. The question is, on the basis of the mercy of God, is that we shouldn't be looking for more of God, for God to give us something. We should be, in fact, giving ourselves up to Him. We need to present ourselves to Him for His work and for His service. The question is, in verse number one, in all actuality, God has done so much for us. What are we doing for Him? That's the question. That's what verse one's about. I beg of you, I beseech you, therefore, therefore, because of all of these chapters, all of the chapters telling us what God has done for us, now it's time for us to give something back to Him. It's time for us to give our bodies back to Him. It's time for us to give our all back to Him because without Him, we'd be nothing. Without Him, we'd be helplessly lost. Without Him, we would be hopelessly lost. Without Him, our destination would be hell instead of heaven. And out of appreciation to Him for all He's done for us in the first 11 chapters, then we owe Him something, and that is we present ourselves back to Him for His service and appreciation for what He's done for us. Amen. Giving ourselves to Him. Now that means that is a challenge to Christians. Because if you'll notice, he said, I beseech you therefore, notice the word brethren. We can't give him anything until we get saved. Anything that we endeavor to do while we're lost is null and void. It's, it's a tinkling symbol of reality. We can't give him our hands to work with, our feet to walk with. We can't give him our talents uh, to work with. We can't give him our mind to think with because a lost person has absolutely nothing to give to the throne of grace. It is only after we become brethren, verse number one. It is only after we know Christ as our Savior and we're redeemed by the grace and the mercy of God that God says in 12.1, on the basis of what I've done for you, I'm asking you now to give yourselves to me that I might work through you to reach a dying and a lost world. That's our responsibility. Now I want you to notice, if you will, a word he says, I beseech you. 
I beseech you. That's a very interesting word. It's a word which means I, I beg of you, please. You would think the human race would be on their knees begging God for mercy. You know what we've all learned and we learn it more as we go from day to day? We're getting old. You say, not me, preacher. I use all of Olay. That's all right. It will eventually break down. You say, I go to the beauty shop. Like the man and his son been on the farm all of their life and they've gone to town for the first time and they're standing in the lobby of a store and they notice this woman gets on this, he called it a machine, the door's open. And this woman, older woman, gets on that machine and the door's closed and there's lights are lighting up. And they're standing there in amazement. They couldn't believe that door would open and uh, so, uh, this woman walk on that elevator. And they're standing there and they're watching these lights flashing on the side of this elevator. And eventually that elevator comes and the door open and a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> beauty queen walks off of that elevator and the little boy looks up at his dad and said, can we get one of them for mama? <laughs> I'm just here to tell you, age has taken its toll on all of our lives. The years are coming, and they're coming so fast. I don't know what's happened to life. It's gone by so fast. Your life is leaving you. We're moving out of here hurriedly. We're going to be gone. You do want to turn around, and we're gone, and we're in eternity. We lose sight of that. God, knowing that through the Apostle Paul, said, Don't close your life out vain. I'm begging you. Verse 1, I beseech you. I'm on my knees. I'm asking you. I'm begging you not to waste it, but to invest it. I'm begging you, God is saying. Well, you'd think God wouldn't have to beg us after he's changed our destination from hell to heaven. You'd think God wouldn't have to beg us because all of the things he's done for us, the goodness of God toward us, a, a friend that stick of closer than a brother with us all the way, even to the end of the age, all that God's done, he's put a roof over our head, clothes on our body, shoes on our feet, automobile in the garage, a place to live, food on the table, all of the blessings and the mercies of God that he has bestowed upon us. You'd think we'd be on our knees saying, thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings you've blessed us with, uh, but we or not. And now he's saved us. He's forgiven us. He's justified us uh, from our sin. We don't have those old sins tagged to us. They're gone, gone, gone. Under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ we stand before God today in the righteousness, robed in the righteousness uh, of his son. You'd think we'd be saying, Lord, you've done so much for me. What can I do for you? Romans 12, 1. I beg you. I beseech you. He's begging us not to waste our lives. And he said, I beseech you by the mercies of God. My friend, the mercies of God should demand that our bodies be given back to him in service. I mean, out of appreciation for what he's done for us. I had a preacher friend several years ago. He and I are very close. I preached for him. He preached for me. He was in another state. Word came to me that he and his wife were starting to have some problems. Then I heard that they'd separated. He was a dear friend of mine. I got my wife in the car one day and we drove to another state. And I found him. Make a long story short, I brought him and his wife to my house, my house, me and my wife, when we lived in another county. And I said to that individual, you're going to pray when I pray, you're going to read your Bible when I read my Bible, you're going to go to church with me. And he stayed with me, I, I, as well as I remember, he and his wife stayed with us for 30 days. 
I will remember at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, me and my wife would be awake and he and his wife had got up and went in the living room and they was fussing and like a bunch of cats. And I'd have to get up and go in there and counsel with them, try to get them reconciled. And, and uh, I, I just, just worked with it. Finally, finally, you know, things worked out. Make a long story short, he became pastor of a church. He was a pastor of that church when he died and went to heaven. He had been at that church, I think, 30-some years. But every year, on the anniversary of them getting together, I'd get a phone call. It'd go something like this. Preacher Beatty, how you doing? Doing fine. How are you? Oh, we're doing fine. I don't want anything other. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving me and my wife enough that you would come after us. You'd put us in your home, you'd counsel with us, got us together. He said, Preacher, if it hadn't been for you, you caring for me and my wife, we wouldn't be together. I wouldn't be the pastor of this church. Our family would be divided. I, I just wanted to call you. I just want to thank you that you loved us enough to come after us. Usually on that day or another day in that week, had two children, at least one of the children would call me. They were grown, had their own families. I'd get a phone call from the children, or at least one of the kids, and Preacher Beatty, I don't want to bother you. I just want to thank you for loving us enough that you'd go after mom and dad. Preacher, because you came, our families together, we celebrate Christmas together, we celebrate Thanksgiving together. I just want to thank you for loving us enough to come after us. Every year, a phone call would come from him or his wife or his son because their family was almost destroyed. But out of thanksgiving and out of appreciation for someone who'd love them enough to come after them, they just want to call and say, thank you, it meant a lot to me. I use that as an illustration, however. Our families are separated. A lot of them are on their way to hell. We're saved, those of you, I hope everybody in this building is saved. I hope everybody watching this, listening to me, I hope everybody is saved, but I've got a sneaking suspicion not everybody's going to hear this is saved. But those of us who are saved, we're debtors. Paul said that in the first chapter of the book of Romans. He said, I am a debtor. I'm a better. I'm a debtor to the bond. I'm a debtor to the free. I'm a debtor to this world. But most importantly, I'm in debt to the Lord who loved me enough to come down here and suffer on Calvary's cross a death like nobody's ever suffered. I'm in debt to him to help his cause, to help his program, to show my appreciation to him. It meant a lot to me when this preacher called me and said, thank you for coming to another state to get me. Thank you for getting, getting our family together. It meant a lot. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of travel. There was a lot of aggravation. But thank God the end results uh, was great. They got together. They salvaged their family. My friend, God did something to reconcile this lost and dying and uh, hell-bent world. He gave the Prince of Glory. He gave his son, his only son, his only begotten son to come down here. No one's ever suffered like he suffered. No one's ever endured the valley uh, that he walked through for you and for me and for us. And most people, when they get saved, then they live the rest of their life as if the Lord had never done one earthly or heavenly thing for them. He takes 11 chapters reminding us of what God did to bring us to himself. And he said, now on the basis of what God's done for you, how about you? How about you giving yourself back to him? How about you presenting your bodies back to him? Notice what he says. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body. I want you to watch this. 
a living sacrifice. He's making a comparison. Because the people of that generation would know what sacrifice was all about because they have come out from under the old covenant, the law. The old law was all about sacrifices. It was all about high priests, earthly priests. It was all about turtle doves and pigeons and bullocks and goats and sheep. They knew about sacrifices. They lived in the arena of sacrifice. But the sacrifices they gave there were dead sacrifices. They slit their throat. They took the blood. They sprinkled the blood around about the altar. And then of a morning, the high priest would take off a certain robe and put on another robe. uh, And he would slit the throat. He'd get the blood. He'd put the lamb. He'd walk up about five steps up on uh, this brazen altar. And he would lay this animal on that altar. And that animal all day long would see from the ashes beneath it. uh, And then of a night, he'd change his robe again. And he'd pull the ashes off the altar. And he'd restroke the altar. He would take another animal of the night and place that animal up on that altar. And he'd come down and he would change his robe again. God said there's got to be a constant sacrifice uh, on the altar down here in Israel. Constant sacrifice. But the sacrifice in Israel was a dead sacrifice. God said to the Christian who's been redeemed by a living Savior, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies not a dead sacrifice. I beseech you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The greatest testimonial to the work of Christ should be through the, through the body of Christ, should be through the church of Jesus Christ. I don't have anybody coming by my house, knocking on my door and ringing my doorbell, asking me to go to church. It's been years. It's very rare that someone would come up to me and ask me about my relationship with the Lord. Very rare. Something's happened to us. We've been blessed so much financially. We've been blessed so much physically. We have been blessed so much as as citizens of the United States of America, we're so, we're so embellished in, embellished in things, in job, in things that's going on. Uh, our next goal, our next goal beyond that, our next goal beyond that. I've got to do this. I've got to get that done. We're so busy going here and there and thinking about this and thinking about that and discussing these things and discussing those things. We forgot we're going to die. We forgot we're going to have to face the Lord. But most importantly, in this very hour, most people have forgot that we have been bought with a price. The price was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We don't belong to ourselves. And out of appreciation for what He has done for us, we need to present ourselves back to, back to him and say, Lord, here I am. I lower the flag on myself. I throw the towel in on myself. I give myself anew, afresh, and anew to you. However you can use me, whatever you want me to do, at the beginning of every day, we need to meet with the Lord on a personal basis and say, Lord, I don't belong to me. Don't let me make decisions today on myself. Let me make decisions today in light of your will for my life. I belong to you. I beseech you, I beg of you, by the mercies of God. Now what are the mercies of God that are found in the book of Romans? I want to give you one today. I may extend this a few services. I don't know. But I want to give you a mercy of God that Paul's talking about when he said, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, he's covered it in the book of Romans, that you give yourself back to the Lord. Turn back in Romans to the fifth chapter. If you will, please, and notice of me, verse number five of Romans chapter number five. Here's one of the mercies of God. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto you. What's one of the mercies of God? God's love. The love of God. You can't comprehend it. 
But I want you to notice what he says here. And I hope make enough shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. It literally means, the word shed abroad is a word which means God's love is poured. It's poured in us. God's love comes to us in our conversion experience. We are made recipients of God's love. And God's love in us should attract us to the one who gave us that love. Because Jesus said, greater love have no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. God's love is shed abroad. It's poured in us. But notice the same chapter. And notice with me verse number 8. But God commended his love. The word commended there means proved. God didn't just send a message down here through the Old Testament writers and the New Testament writers. God didn't just send a message down here and say, I just want you to know from heaven's throne, I love you. That was true. But the word commended there means proved. God said, let me tell you how much I love you. Let me prove to you how much I love you. That's what the word means. I'm going to prove to you how much I love you by giving up my son. It's not idle talk. It's not jibber jabber. God said, I want you to know that I love you to the extent. In verse number eight, he commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sins, Christ died for us. Look at the word for means instead of. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. There's not a parent in this building who would give a child up for anybody. You would never give a child up for a friend even if, you, even if a friend said, uh, I need a sacrifice, would you be willing to give your child up? You wouldn't even turn it over in your mind. But I'll tell you one thing, if an enemy came up to you and said, would you give your child up for me? Automatically, you'd probably slap them in the face. But let me tell you who God gave his son up for. Enemies. All of sin, Romans 3. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're his enemies. We've sinned against him. We've rebelled against the high throne of heaven and the condemnation of God rests upon us. And yet here in Romans chapter number five and verse number eight, God proved his love. He said, you know how much I love you? Here's what he did in results. This is how much I love you. He stretched himself out on a cross. He allowed those spikes to be driven in his hands and his feet. He allowed the crown of thorns to be placed on his head. He allowed a sword to pierce uh, his side. He was beaten uh, and he was spit upon and he was cursed. But that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing, he took the whole load of the condemnation of your sin and my sin and he suffered our eternity on the cross. He said, hey, let me tell you how much I love you. I'm going to the cross for you. Now he said, will you do one thing for me? Now that I'm going to the cross for you, would you live for me? Will you give me your body? Will you allow me to live my life through you? You know, God's love is unbounded. You hear people say something like this. Well, my love is as, for you is as tall as the mountain. But that mountain has a peak to it. I think Mount Mitchell is probably the highest mountain in North Carolina. Everest, I think, is the highest mountain in the world. If I remember correctly, it's 30,000 feet, nearly six miles high. That's a high mountain. 
And that would be impressive to any young dating couple when the boy would say to the girl, my love for you is as high as Mount Everest. And she'd probably say, wow. And if she said to him, my love for you is as tall as a molehill, he'd probably say, this thing's not going very far. But when somebody would say, my love for you is as tall as the mountains, I'd say, wow, that's great love. But that summit says there's a pinnacle, there's a peak. But when it comes to the love of God, there's no pinnacle. When it comes to the love of God, there's no peak. It goes on into infinity. I've heard people say through the years, my love for you is as large as the ocean. That's a lot of water. You go down and you look out over that vast ocean. I remember one of our missionaries years ago, Brother Tom Rigby, he and his wife both now bless their heart. They're in the presence of the Lord. He'd never been off anywhere, but a, pre, a friend of mine picked him up for the first time and brought him to America. He lived on a little island about 30 some miles wide, 30 some miles long out there down in the Turks and Caicos Islands, down in the British West Indies. Brother Gene Davis, who's in heaven, also picked him up one day to bring him over here to introduce him to some churches in America. And he flew out over the water, got out over Florida. He said, Brother Tom, sitting there in that airplane, he's looking down over Miami. He keeps going. He gets out of Florida, gets up over Georgia, and uh, gets up over uh, Alabama. And he said, Tom just keeps looking out the window. Finally, he turned to my friend who's piloting the plane. He said, this is the biggest island I've ever flown over in my life. Man, he thought it was something to fly over a nation with the boundaries as large as the boundaries of our country. And somebody say, hey, I love you as much as the width of the ocean. But you know what? The ocean has shoreline. You can leave today and you can fly about 3,000 miles across the water and you'll be on the other side of the country and there's a shoreline over there. The ocean is surrounded by shoreline. But when it comes to God's love, there's no shoreline. When it comes to God's love, there's absolutely no way in the world we can comprehend or define it. There's no pinnacle. There's no shoreline. His love goes on and on and on and on. There's a lot of beautiful music that's been written about the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the high star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean feel and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man ascribed by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and the angels' song. I want you to listen to this verse of Scripture in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 3 and verse number 19. And to know the love of, God, uh, the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of Christ. He said to know the love of Christ. That word means to know it by experience. Those of us who are saved, we know something about the love of Christ. He came to us while we were his enemies. But then he said this, it passes knowledge. The love of Christ passive knowledge. The love of Christ passive what we know about his knowledge, the knowledge of his love. That's what he's saying. And no matter how much the saint experiences the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
There's still oceans of the love of Christ that have never been touched by our experience. And the more we know about him, the more we understand that we can't even begin to touch the depth and the height and the breadth and the width of the love of God. It's beyond us. It's beyond us. But thank God it's ours. Amen. That he would love us the way he loved us. You know, the Bible uses illustrations to talk about the love of God. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the mercy of his love, that we present our bodies back to him. There are illustrations in the Bible, and there's illustrations out in the secular world that we could use to talk about the mercy of God's love. Years ago, I read a story of a book I have in my study by a man named George Morrison, Matheson, excuse me, George Matheson. George Matheson was a man who was engaged to a lady to be married to her. And he loved her dearly. She was the dearest thing in this world to him. He started having some problems one day with his vision. And he went to the doctor. And they ran all the tests. And they said, Mr. Matheson, I hate to tell you this, but it's just a matter of time. You're going to be completely blind. You're going to be losing all of your sight. He felt it his responsibility to go to his fiancée and tell her what the doctor had told him. He really wasn't worried about it because he believed that her love for him was of such a nature that she would say, Honey, I'm so sorry, but we're in this thing together. I'll look after you. I love you. But he went to his fiance and he explained what the doctor had told him and she reached down with her one hand and she pulled the engagement ring off of her finger and she handed the engagement ring back to George Matheson and she said, why George, I couldn't be tied to a blind man the rest of my life. And in a moment, all of his dreams and aspirations shattered. He couldn't believe it. He loved her. If it had been a reversal role, he would have been glad to give the rest of his life looking after her. But she said, I, I can't be bound the rest of my life with a blind man, with darkness closing in on him from his fiance, and with darkness closing in on him by losing his eyesight. Broken and crushed, he went to his room. He got a pencil and piece of paper out. And he wrote these words, O oh love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. He said, she's left me. But there is a love that won't let me go. Amen. That love is the love of God. It's the mercy of God. You want me to tell you how much Christ loves you? Let me tell you how you can figure it out. Look at bloody Calvary. If you want to know how much the Lord loves you, take a look at Calvary. Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself for our sins. 1 Peter 3, 18, the Bible says, For Christ also hath once suffered sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. You can tell how much a person loves you by the, the amount of suffering they're willing to endure for you. And let me tell you, there's nobody that's ever loved you like Jesus. And here's the crazy thing that we can't figure out. He loved us that way when he knew what we were. And he still came. He still decided to come and go to the cross of Calvary for us. Knowing that we were sinners, knowing we were reprobates, knowing we should go to hell. He said, I'll come down there and fix that. If they'll trust me, I'll save them. I'll forgive them. And when he does that, I feel obligated. I've done it most of my life. I feel an obligation. Lord, it's not I that liveth, but it's Christ who liveth in me. I owe him my life. A preacher friend of mine named Clyde Box 
Brother Box pastored a church in DeSoto, Texas. Pastored there a long time. I, I think I heard recently that Brother Box is in heaven. But lastly, I read this story that Brother Clyde Box told. I think it illustrates the love of God. Brother Box uh, was teaching a Sunday school class at his church, and he had a bunch of rebel rousers. But there was one young man in his Sunday school class. His name was Alvin Caldwell. He said there's something about Alvin when he came in the room. Alvin was lost, but he said when Alvin would come in the room, the room would just light up. He said Alan didn't look after himself very well. He said his hair was sticking in every, every direction you could think of and said he never had his shirt tail tucked in. It was always out. But it's something about him. He just lit the room up. And Brother Box said, I told Alvin, said, I'm going to get by to see you one of these days. And they established a time and Brother Box went there and his mom met him at the door and said, I'm sorry, Alvin's not here right now. But Alvin's been looking for you. He said you're going to come out here. He said, Alvin said the preacher's going to come. He said, I want to get saved. The preacher's going to come tell me how to be saved. He said, preacher, can you wait just a little while? He would hate to know that he missed you. And Brother Box said, I waited 30 minutes and said, I had another appointment, so I just had to go. And so I started out the door, and here come Alvin. Alvin had a big old smile on his face and said, preacher, I told Mama you'd come. I've been waiting for you to come, preacher. I want to get, I want to get saved. Brother Box told Alvin how to get saved that day. And he said to Alvin, now Alvin, here's what I want you to do now that you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior. I want you to come to church Sunday morning. I want you to walk down the aisle and I want you to let the church know now that you've trusted Christ. I want you to make a public profession of faith. Just walk down that aisle. And he said, I'll meet you there at the altar. And Alvin said to the pastor, I'll see you. I promise you I'll be there. Pastor said, I looked all week forward to going to church on Sunday. And he said, I got in the auditorium and I looked around and said, Alvin wasn't there. He said, I thought Alvin might come in a little late, but said, I, I got up to preach and Alvin wasn't there. And he said, I looked for him all through the service and Alvin didn't show up. And he said, I'm wondering in my mind what in the world's happened to Alvin. And he said, we gave the invitation. And as we're giving the invitation, I looked at the door and there came Alvin. He missed the service. But he came for invitation. His hair was in a thousand different directions. And had his shirt tail out. Said so Alvin walked down the aisle and he came up to Pastor Box and said, I told you I'd be here. Pastor Box didn't know at the time, but he found out after the service. He said, Pastor, he said, I'm sorry, I'm I'm late. He said, my dad's a drunk. And he said, my dad kept me out last night past midnight. He said, my dad was going from one bar to another bar and I had to be with him. He said, my mom and dad separated and I had to be with my dad last night. And he said, my dad took me from bar to bar. He said, I stayed in the car. But somebody said, my dad got drunker as the night went on. One bar to the next bar to the next bar. And he said, I'm thinking, I promised that preacher I'd be in church and I want to be in church tomorrow. He said, Pastor, after midnight, I just got out of my dad's car and I started walking. He said, I walked through the night. He said, I walked till I got so tired. I found an old wrecked car and he said, I got in the back seat of the car just to take a nap. I didn't think I'd go home. And he said, the sun came up and he said, the sun hit my face. It awakened me. And he said, I've been walking. Since midnight, with the exception of a little night, night now, I've been walking to try to get here because I told you I'd be here. And he made his public profession of faith. They baptized him. Brother Box said, just a little while later, a preacher called him and said, Brother Box, And when you had something to do with Alvin Caldwell, and he said, yeah, I said, I had the privilege of winning him to the Lord. He said, I hate to tell you that Alvin got killed. Pastor Box said, I was so sad. But then he said, you know, I got to thinking. Alvin never had an opportunity 
come out of a broken home, his dad was a drunk, then had nothing. He said, I got to thinking, Al, we don't have to worry about a father now because he's got a heavenly father. I got to thinking, one day I'm going to get to heaven. And he said, I believe that Alvin's going to walk up to me. He's going to point his finger at me like he did at church that Sunday. And he's going to say, Pastor, I told you I'd be here. He said, I'm going to get to see Alvin again. Because the love of God is not particular in whom he saves. There's a dear friend of mine years ago used to go from church to church. Brother Tim's wife knew him. He'd go from church to church and had a little old accordion. He'd play and sing. Something happened to him. He had a huge head. He wasn't much to look at. But he got in the pulpit of a church I was at one Sunday having an afternoon service. He got in the pulpit. He had that little accordion and he would play on that accordion. Jesus keeps me happy because Jesus knows how. And he'd get up and testify and, he, and I heard him say this. He said, I'm not much to look at. But he said, Jesus loves me. And he went across the country playing that little old accordion and telling people that Jesus loved him. And he said, Jesus saved me because he wanted to prove to the world that he wasn't particular in whom he dwelt. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies to the Lord a living sacrifice. He indwelled us, sinners saved by grace. He loves to live within us. He's thankful for us. We are the trophies of grace that he points to. And the angels, he says to the angels in the book of Ephesians, and he will in the future, the angels will come by and they'll look at the church redeemed and glorified and they'll give praise to the Savior that he could redeem people like you and I. The mercy of God includes the love of God for you and for me and for us. I don't want to shortchange him. Whatever I've got left, I want him to have it. Whatever you got left, you ought to say, Lord, I want you to have it. Because that's all that really matters. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Please don't be selfish and say, well, my life is mine. No, it's not. If you're saved, you've been redeemed. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Be willing to give yourself to him after he's given so much for you. Maybe, maybe today you're kind of out in the spiritual wilderness. You're not where you need to be, not where you ought to be, not where you should be. Why don't you make your way down to this altar today and say, Lord, you've done so much for me. The least I can do out of appreciation to you is to give myself back to you to be used however you may choose to use me. Father, I thank you today for this passage of Scripture. I ask you now in Jesus' name to help us to recommit ourselves, our love to you for all of the love you have expressed to us. Help us in this invitation today to make decisions that are eternal decisions based on eternal truths. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. We sing this stanza. If others need to come, would you come? <laughs>